And now we come to Jean-Claude, the one of us who's actually been there, seen it, and done it, <laughs> and uh, can speak with, a, with an authority. That, uh, <coughs> I, don't know. I don't know whether I, I will speak with authority. Uh, I share, of course, uh, many of the views that have been expressed. I have uh, six points I would like to make uh, first, but very rapidly. First, it is absolutely true that we have a currency which is an hegemon in the present uh, system, but it is not entirely unipolar, and then I am a little bit, uh, I would say, uh, out of uh, the emerging consensus. And of course, we should not forget that the, the structure of the system changed dramatically, I would say, overnight in January 99, when we created the euro, because before you had one currency, the hegemon, 10 times more important, depending on your criteria, than the other. And that is a system where you can say, well, uh, you don't need to be a great mathematician to see, to, to, to see that it, is, it has a structure which is a totally different nature from the present system, where you have an hegemon, a number two, which is five times the number three, and which is only three times less important than the number one. So we change dramatically, in my opinion, the system of the international currency. So everybody knows the figure. They have been said forex, 60, 24 percent, international debt, 60, 22 percent, international loans, 60, 20. That is the new structure. Now, now, that being said, when I look at the global payment currency, I have different figures which uh, are illustrating the fact that the euro indeed exists. 45% for the dollar, 35%, 34% for the euro, 4% for the yen. That is the proportion in global uh, payment currency according to the BIS. So why is there such a difference between the global payment currency and forex international debt, international loans. Despite the fact that the trends are a little bit different from what was coming out of the discussion until now. When you look at the figures, you see that the dollar had 70% at the very beginning, the day we created the euro. It was 70% in reserve currencies. The euro was as computed as was done by uh, our eminent colleague, uh, 19, so the same level as today in adding up all the currencies. Today it is still 20, but the dollar came from 70 to 60, 62. And all, all other currency gained market share. So there is a trend which is not negligible, at least according to that criteria of reserve currency, which is not uh, hurting the, the euro, but uh, is hurting a little bit the dollar, as I just uh, underlined. So still, of course, the dollar is an hegemon. Uh, hysteresis has been mentioned very wisely uh, uh, as regards uh, the, the reason why when you have had the central position, you keep the central position for a long time. I was amazed myself to see that the copper was traded in sterling until 93, aluminum until 87, tea until 92, coffee until 92, long, long, long after World War II. And if not, not too uh, uh, misinformed, cocoa uh, only after 2015. So hysteresis is there. And uh, of course, it's associated with complementarity, but also with the easiness that you have to continue to have the same unique uh, of account if the currency itself remains liquid, of course. Uh, now there is another reason which is dominating and uh, our colleagues were all very eloquent on that. Of course, what counts is your currency, but also the signature behind the currency. The treasuries, if you take the benchmark, the other signatories. And there, of course, we are at a fantastic disadvantage in Europe because it's true that the difference uh, between the volume of the treasuries is uh, very, very important. Uh, the daily trading uh, of treasuries in volume in New York is $500 billion, 
and the equivalent in Germany, in France, uh, in Italy would be approximately uh, the uh, one twenty-fifth of that level. So we are in totally different universe. Only the creation of a new safe bond would create an element of uh, death and liquidity on the euro market, which would permit uh, to accelerate the transition. And uh, that is really the point. The point is not that the currency has defect, in my opinion. The currency, frankly speaking, I take it as no defect. But the problem, of course, is that the signatories be behind the currency are not the same. Even if you have already euro bonds, the bonds that are uh, issued by uh, the ESM, for instance, or, or uh, the EIB uh, are uh, good signatories, but of course, it is a very small amount. Now, shall I deplore the fact that we are not at 50-50 vis-a-vis the US dollar? Certainly not, because had it been the case, what would have been the consequence on the exchange market? Which kind of skyrocketing of the euro vis-a-vis -vis the dollar would uh, we have registered? Uh, unless, of course, it would have been organized with uh, special accounts, uh, the IMF behind, and so forth. But if we are in a universe where uh, we are in a free uh, behavior of market participants, of course, it would have been a total catastrophe. So uh, we, we would have become uh, totally uh, out of uh, com cost competitiveness, if I may, in the global uh, um, uh, trade. So I am not unhappy with the way it proceeds. It's, it's a big transformation, but a progressive one. Uh, now, that being said, is it because uh, of the uh, fact that the euro is not yet an international currency of the size of the dollar, that we have problem with Iran, that we have problem with the sanctions of the US and so forth? I don't trust it is the case. I trust the problem is that the United States, for cultural reason and political reason, does not hesitate to blackmail all those who are not participating in the sanctions. And when I look at all the European firms, it is not because they could not settle their trade in dollars that they interrupted totally their trade with Iran. It was because they would lose a lot in their own interest in the United States of America and uh, more largely in the world because the US uh, had uh, a, a lot of uh, legal capacity to, to uh, uh, tease them. So, uh, again, the main problem we have, in my opinion, in Europe, if we reason on the Europe balancing the US, is of, of a political nature. Uh, both the treasuries and the safe bonds, which are not there, and the, capa the geopolitical capacity to say, if you blackmail us, then we will blackmail you. And uh, let's see, that, let's uh, agree that there is no reason that you would impose uh, us, in particular, your own sanctions. Uh, I, it seems to me that it is there that we have the real problem. Iran, the recent Iran, the recent experience of trying to create a special vehicle to bypass the US, the US dollar proved uh, that it was not, a, not the problem. We have no problem to bypass the dollar. We have a real problem to bypass the capacity of the US to impose legally its sanctions everywhere. Now we are stop there, if you permit, John, because I would have some, can I have uh, two, two more? Please, Minutes? go, go okay. ahead. So um, on the future of the system, uh, as many of the speakers, I trust that, of course, the renminbi, when it is fully convertible and when there is a clear will to participate with full convertibility in the international monetary system, we'll, we will have necessarily a large multipolar world. And uh, that would be, again, probably sooner than we think but we are far away, nevertheless, in terms of uh, conditions to be a real uh, international currency. How will we run that? There are several possible assumptions. We could run that as we have run the so-called uh, hegemon, but uh, nevertheless, with a G5 from, or G7, whatever, uh, from time to time, giving some indications to the market that uh, the dollar is going too low or the dollar is going too high, and I participated in all the uh, such agreements. 
they, they are very important, they are useful. They were not necessary in the most recent period of time because for reasons that are extremely complex, the international system, the core currencies were relatively stable, even in the worst crisis ever since World War II. So this is something which academia is looking at, but I have no convincing conclusion to understand why we were not trapped in one of these uh, large fluctuations that we had before. Uh, and uh, uh, that, that is an open question. But of course, we can imagine that the four, the five major currencies would from time to time give some indications of what they see and uh, tell the market uh, uh, as we did uh, in the Louvre agreement, in many such agreements. The last one was uh, the Japanese uh, 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 G7, G5 agreement where uh, we gave market important indications and uh, I was very happy myself to participate in this, uh, in this uh, message to, to, to the market. Uh, we could imagine to have a basket of currencies uh, and the SDR perhaps could be, if there is a private SDR market, I mean, it means a lot of will to arrive to that uh, consequence. I don't exclude totally that. And it seems to me that the fact that the same definition of price stability is now uh, the definition of the major issuing currencies for the present basket of SDR, renminbi being a part, but the four other have more or less the same definition of price stability. It is something which uh, has not been looked at very carefully, but is very important in my understanding. And of course, I eliminate, I have to say, the possibility of the bank or, uh, or and I don't trust that a digital currency if it is not backed by either a central bank or a pool of central banks could float. It, you would really need behind those institutions or this institution which would be responsible for the currency to have all the three characteristics which were mentioned by Jeff and our uh, Aristotelian uh, definition of a currency, if I'm not misled, the, the three that you have mentioned. Thank you. Thank you.